Hi there, this is Carl Irwin, and this is going to be a grab a cup of coffee kind of discussion and tutorial. Um, we're going to touch on a wide range of topics here, some on composition, orchestration, uh, mock-ups, and particularly MuseScore 4. Now, I've already done a couple of videos on MuseScore 4, talking about the way that I use it, uh, but I got a specific comment on a recent release of a um, piece of music that I composed and rendered out in MuseScore 4. Uh, and uh, on the video comments, I got, uh, I got this question. Uh, the viewer says, I've been using MuseScore 4, but I'm still not satisfied with the final sound of the environment, despite the excellent quality of the new library that the program offers. Um, and then he goes on to ask me uh, if I am using any plugins to make the sound more realistic, and if I am using them, which ones and or how am I using them? Uh, and uh, just just inquiring mind about the sound. Uh, some of you may be using MuseScore 4 and you're finding that it's certainly improved and realistic, uh, but maybe not realistic enough for your taste. Uh, and you're wondering how some people uh, are getting really, really great results on them. And there's, I think, a few ways to answer that. Uh, I'm just going to play this back. Why don't we listen to the whole thing?
All right. So that's the, the whole thing beginning to end. Um, number one, I am not using any external plugins at all. So all of the sound on these mock-ups so far has come directly from MuseScore's output. Uh, so this is Muse Sounds using their play engine. Um, and that brings me to the first point, is that make sure that when you install your sounds, that in the mixer, those sounds are in place. Uh, so you can see that I'm using Muse sounds in all of these. You see one here, it says MS Basic. So there's a trumpet sound. I have a trumpet sound, but I'm using an MS Basic trumpet sound, the old uh, sound font, um, fluid general MIDI sound font, uh, is being used in here. Now there's a reason for that, which I'll talk about down the line here if we get to it. But these are all Muse sounds. So you want to make sure that you have all of the Muse sounds installed and that they have been selected. Um, I have found that you might be in the middle of upgrading. If you run Muse Hub and it's upgrading and then you stop the upgrade and then jump into a project, if it's, say, upgrading the woodwind section, you'll find that all of the woodwinds will automatically be swapped to the MS Basic sounds because there's not a full working library in place. It got interrupted in the upgrade. And if you open a project and, and then close it, you might be stuck with those sounds. You'll have to reload uh, instrument by instrument the Muse sounds that you want. So those kinds of things can happen. Just make sure that you're running Muse sounds to begin with uh, where you want them. Uh, the second thing I'll point to is the mixer itself. Now, I'm on Linux. Linux has uh, limited capability for reasons that I don't understand uh, why they've put the ownness on the Linux community. Most of us are not developers. We're just users. Uh, we're not going to be able to fix this problem on our own. You know, the developers need to do that. Uh, but they've put it on the community, apparently, to make a normal capability for the program even available. Uh, and as you look at the progress reports on the project, uh, you'll see that nobody at GitHub has taken up the implementation of VST in Linux or LV2 for that matter, which would be an extra capability. But the VST is supposed to be universal. Nobody has taken that up from the community. I've already whined about this before. I'm not going to keep whining about it. But anyway, I'm not using anything special. I don't even have the capability to use VSTs in here. It's just Muse Sounds, and it is just the mixer. So in the mixer, what I do have is fader capability. So I can set levels, uh, and then I can also set pan. So make sure you're doing that. Make sure you have pan set, that you're panning instruments in space as they would be or, or you would like them to be on a stage, and really go for it. So. You can see the way I have my situation set is I set violin 1 all the way to the left, and I have it at negative 70%, 70% to the left. Then I have violin 2 all the way to the right, 70% to the right. Now, this is not a typical setup. Usually, uh, the setup would be violin 1, and then violin 2 would also be on the left, and then you'd have violas more central, and then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, just off-center to the right, and then, and then uh, celli off to the right, uh, opposite of violin one. Contrabasses also would be slightly off to the right. I am mixing for recording um, kind of atmosphere, a rendering, so more of a, a film score soundtrack kind of environment. And I want a little bit more balance in voicing rather than what you would get in a concert hall. So what I do, and this is not unheard of, by the way, there are some or orchestra setups can be set like this, just less common. But I've got violin one all the way to the left, violin two all the way to the right, and it's, it's pretty extreme. Then I move violas uh, to the left of center, celli to the right of center, and then I put the contrabasses in the middle, which spatially does not make any sense because there's going to be other instruments in that place. But sonically, it does make sense to put that bass kind of central. That's where the subwoofer would be in a sound system. Uh, so I just kind of cater to that setup. Um, but anyway, I have a stereo set up right and you want to make sure you're doing that put instruments in space in a logical order i have uh the wind section is a little bit more narrow i have the strings kind of separated out but then the winds are a little bit more narrow and again i try to put the bass instruments more central uh in the other uh sections as well so faders and pan and think about 
the volume of instrumentation, right? Brass are loud. I want the brass to be up. Woodwinds are not, they don't really, they're not supposed to really hold a candle to the brass when playing full out. Now, higher frequency instruments like the piccolo flute, they're going to cut through a little bit more uh, clarinet in the high register. So they're, they're high, but they're not as high as the brass. I have the brass pushed up, particularly the trumpets pushed up much higher. I find the trombone samples are a little soft, so I push them up a little bit. Um, and uh, horn and tuba got it amped up, right? I bring the woodwinds down, and then the, I do the same thing over here with the strings. I have them kind of balanced out. High frequency violin one, it's a very high part, and I really push the range in my um, arrangement here in my in my piece. So I I push the violin one down a little bit below violin two because the high frequency is obviously going to cut through, travel faster and further than the other frequencies. So I just pull them back a little bit to try to balance out. But you can see the strings are down. Uh, the woodwinds are down. Some of them are really down. Clarinet I pull down quite a bit. And the brass I push harder. So try to get a more realistic balance uh, than what it gives you when everything is flat uh, by using the faders. Uh, percussion, same kind of thing, right? I pull the snare drum back a little bit, pull the cymbals down a little bit, these high frequencies that cut through. Push the bass drum up. It's kind of a soft sample again. Pull the glockenspiel down, right? The bells, I pull them way back. Timpani's kind of neutral. Uh, piano, I pull this way back. You want to, you want things to sound like they're set back in space a little bit, uh, and you use the faders to accomplish that, and also the pan setting. So, um, that's, that's number one. Make sure that you have all of this set up properly. You're using the right samples, you're using the mixer faders, and you're using the pan capabilities and really pushing extremes on sections that should have it. Um, a third thing I might add is that you can approach more realism by using uh, layered samples. So if I have strings, I might use not just section strings, but it may be a, an iteration of solo strings, a solo violin one, solo violin two, and then put those in a slightly different pan so that it sets apart from the section strings. It can kind of have that one player that sticks out a little bit, and you can differentiate the notation a little bit. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but these are techniques. Now, this is all about realism after all. Now, I, I, let's, let's back up a bit and talk about what we're using MuseScore for, for in the first place. I got into this debate uh, on the forums with one of the moderators about the purpose of MuseScore.com. The .com site where you have no, uh, your notation, you can put uh, notation files up and share them. Uh, and what I said in my initial statement was that .com really is focused on notation rather than on music. I don't use the .com because my interest is really in the music. It's not really in the notation. And this person took a big issue with this. And of course, it's about the music. I said, "Well, I don't think you. I don't think you understand what I'm saying." This is an engraving software, and the .com website is about engraved music. It's about notation. It's about having clean notation. It's kind of like a website that focuses on the font right, of a text document rather than the words, the speech, the ideas that are in it. Now, I do understand that you're sharing music, and ultimately people are sharing music there, but it really is about notation. It's about Muse Score's notation engraving capability. When we're talking about realism in mock-up, we are not at all concerned about notation. Not at all. Not even a little bit. The only reason why you'd be concerned about notation is if you are engraving a part that is either going to be shared for its artistic value or if it's going to be shared, printed off, for people to actually play live music, right? So you want clean notation for people to play live music. When you look at these orchestral scores, let's get real for a minute. Now, I went to music school. Um, my undergraduate study, this is over 25 years ago now, my undergraduate study was in music education. I was a trumpet player, so that was my major instrument. I was in the trumpet studio, of course I played there, and then I was studying to be a music teacher, learning instruments, learning uh, uh, various types of um, uh, educational techniques, right, and philosophies. 
uh, teaching instrumental music. And, uh, and then later in my undergraduate work, I took some composition study extra. I added that to my uh, audit sheet, a few composition classes with a couple of different teachers. Um, and I really got into the composition side of things. I'd already been composing a little bit on the side, even before I went to school and I was in high school. But I really got into it in a big way at that time. And then what I did is I immediately followed up my undergraduate music education degree with a composition master's. So I went back to school uh, for a master's degree in music composition. And I favored big orchestral pieces. Much of my music was large ensemble. Fortunately for me, in music school, I was able to get some pieces played by large groups, just a couple. It wasn't usually the major works. It was often uh, uh, the few times I got to do that, it was commissioned because uh, someone in a department chair position would come to me and ask, you know, they would essentially commission me to arrange or to write something. Uh, in one case, I wrote something in the studio, and uh, the orchestral director said, why don't we play this? And it was offered to me, so we performed, you know, an orchestral piece. Uh, I was lucky. I mean, that was that's really rare. Usually, the only time you'll get a, a large piece performed by a large group, and I don't mean like a chamber group or a quintet or a chamber ensemble, but a large symphonic group is going to be if you maybe enter into a competition and you get selected. And even then, in those circumstances in school, uh, you're lucky if they sight-read it. They might just sight-read the piece. In my case, I got pieces that actually got rehearsed and then played. Now, after I was done with school and I still had some connections and was still living near the university, uh, the college that I went to, the School of Music, I uh, was approached again by the wind ensemble director at the time and was commissioned then to do something more on a professional level outside of the school atmosphere. And I composed a piece for the wind ensemble. That was another commission I got. And I wrote a piece for that and got it played. Very rare. Now, after that, once I kind of lost contact and connection with those people and I moved on in my career as a teacher, um, I'm not getting stuff played anymore. I mean, it just isn't going to happen. The only way you're going to get these orchestral pieces played by a real, you know, full ensemble is if you enter a competition, uh, you win, or you're a finalist, and you get it sight read. And that's that's a, an extreme rarity, right? Um, on top of that, the only time you'll get something performed is if you're a commissioned composer and you get a lot of commissions and you get things, you know, read by groups. And usually if you get something commissioned, it'll probably be, be by a scholastic group, usually for band, wind ensemble. But the orchestral stuff is quite untouchable. Even in film music, so much of the film music you hear today, apart from large studio works, uh, you know, short films, small independent projects, it's all mock-up. It's never in notation. It's all done in the DAW, in the Digital Audio Workstation. It's MIDI um, sequenced, and then you apply virtual instruments to that, and then it gets mocked up, and then that is often the, the actual track that's used in the, in the project. Um, so much orchestral music is never put into notation. Now, why am I going on this rant? Well, I think we got to, I think if you're going after realism in Muse Score 4, I think the first thing you ought to do is get off the high horse of notation. Yes, MuseScore 4 is a notation program. It's very good for writing notation, for engraving. However, if we're going for realism in a mock-up, you got to forget about the fact that it is a notation program and start treating it like a MIDI sequencer, just like you would any other digital audio workstation and with the virtual instrument libraries on it. Okay, so to get that mentality... Um, because otherwise, the only reason to really engrave something absolutely as if to be played is if it's going to be played. And your orchestral compositions are not going to get played. They just aren't. Very few of them will. Now, I know there's going to be some of you out there, a few of you say, well, I've had stuff played. I understand. So have I. And, and, and you know, there's, there's opportunity. But those opportunities are not extensive. Even someone who's well-connected in a large composition studio... For someone who does regular film music work, even those people rarely get their stuff played by an orchestra. 
Um, even honestly, you take take a take a composer that composes for large films. How often do they get their music played by orchestra? Only at the scoring session. Up until then, they're dealing with mock-ups. It's mock-ups, mock-ups, mock-ups until everything's approved, till the budget's laid out, till the money's there, and then you get the people together, and then you score it. And that's when it gets played by the large orchestra. So even for them, it's rare. Um, yeah, so don't worry about notation. Forget about notation. This piece, if, if I show you real quick, I'm going to go to page view. And we'll just zoom in and let you see this mess. Nothing is formatted properly. I got extra measure on the beginning. It doesn't come in a pad. I don't even have a title on the thing. I am not interested in any of the stuff, in the fonts, anything like that. Just not really, you know, I'm not, I'm not I don't care. I don't have double bar lines in there to denote anything. I don't have rehearsal markings. Like, what's this going on? Look, I got, like, parts stacked up here. The horns, there's only one horn line. There's only one one French horn line. And I've got these notes stacked up right there, right? So, you know, what's what's going on here? What's all of this about? You, you'll notice there's no key signatures anywhere. I never, ch there's, you can see I have the transposition keys, but there's no key signatures anywhere. I don't change keys. I'm writing all in C score. Now, I change. I modulate. I'm changing key all the time. I modulate a ton in this thing, but it's not It's not in there, right? I, I don't care about the notation. I just don't care. I am after the mock-up, okay? So, number one rule in trying to get a realistic um, uh, output on MuseScore 4, make sure you have your sounds enabled. Make sure you have your mixer settings right. Make sure you have pan set right. Rule number two, don't worry about the notation. Focus on calling on the appropriate samples at the appropriate time. You're going to be doing unorthodox things. You're going to be using unorthodox uh, notational methods to get what you want. Like, what is this down here? Fortissimo and then a sudden, you know, decrescendo here to mezzo piano crescendo. For this is a forte piano, but this is how I notated it. See, it's offset. I've got an eighth note at, uh, accent tied, eighth note tied to a dotted half with a decrescendo down to mezzo and the horns. And then down here in the trumpets, I've got a quarter note decrescendo to mezzo piano on the dotted half. It's a little offset. This is just a, a forte piano, but I, I notated it to get samples to play the way I want to. I didn't use FP crescendo, right? And if I play this back, just hear this moment, And it's a, it's a relatively clean, realistic forte piano, right? Because I'm not using the flawed rendition of MuseScore 4 sample set with FP. I notated exactly the way I wanted it, and I offset it on purpose. So um, that's, that's it. Treat this like a DAW. Treat it like the digital audio workstation. Another debate that comes up when using notation programs and uh, digital audio workstations and electronic uh, music capabilities in general, there is a camp of people that still persist today that suggests that creativity, you know, music genius, creativity, is ruined by notation programs, by sequencers, by digital audio workstations. It takes people with lesser skill and gives them greater ability than what they otherwise have. Um, that is a suggestion that's made. Um, that is a bunch of nonsense. It's a total lie. Uh, that perspective comes from people who have no idea what they're talking about. And I don't care if they went to Eastman or Juilliard or, or Berkeley. I don't care. I don't care where they come from. They don't know what they're talking about. I think the assertion is, is that people that use electronic uh, composing techniques as a reference are cheating. That a true musical genius, true composing, uh, can be done with pencil and paper from the mind. Um, I don't know any composers that do that. I know a lot of composers. I know a lot of great composers. None of them do that. Um, even people that just use pencil and paper, they don't just use pencil and paper. They will sit at a piano 
they will use an instrument uh, to uh, uh, kind of test out ideas. And it's from there that they sample their concepts and then they put them to pencil uh, to paper with pencil. Um, and that is no different than using a notation program or even a digital audio workstation working in MIDI. It's, it's identical. There's no difference between the two. You can try to justify that there is, but you're lying to yourself. There is no difference. You're just getting a reference. It's, you get it from a different place. You can get it from an instrument or you can get it from an instrument. You can get it from an acoustic instrument and a keyboard or you can get it from a digital instrument. Notation programs for the longest time have had pretty pitiful playback. Um, this this engine is quite novel uh, in that it really sounds like orchestra. We'll get to that in a minute about how real it is, but I mean it's pretty pretty darn close, right? Uh, using MIDI sound fonts before this, and even some really great libraries, uh, Garitan Personal Orchestra, you know, was supposed to be really great they're lousy i mean they don't sound real at all you always had to use your imagination to to hear what it is you're trying to compose in the samples that were being played back so reference is reference it doesn't matter if it's here or if it's on a piano it's the same exact process now i'll prove this to you because if you take a lot of people that traditionally wrote uh, pencil to paper i think of like alan silvestri the guy studied classical composition and jazz composition at Berkeley, uh, scored for television, went on to score some of the biggest Hollywood movies ever and some of the greatest film scores ever, uh, Back to the Future being among them. And at that time, it was pencil to paper. Uh, today, the same guy, same man, he uses Dorico notation and he doesn't even start with that. Uh, my understanding is he starts in, he starts in Cubase. Uh, it mocks up in MIDI like a lot of other people. He starts in the mock-up, and then it gets transcribed by Dorico and then by uh, a team of copyists that you know do do the orchestration. So it's the same man, different era, different tool set, same process, same ideas, same same needs, right? Uh, you can create really, really, really great music. You don't have to really have any additional uh, uh, um, skill sets beside that. However, you do need to have vocabulary. This brings me to point number three. So all of that to come around to what you do need. You do need to know how to do orchestration properly. You need to know what voice doublings work. You need to know um, how articulations play with each other. Um, you need to know what things are supposed to sound like. The sound is more important, again, than the notation. If you look, take a look closer down here again. Look, it's a mess. I've got forte down here, fortissimo up here. You would think that this should balance. If I was writing this notation, it would. Ah, but the samples that I'm calling upon require me to do this. I found that if I make everything fortissimo, I don't really get the balance that I want. I don't get the samples that I want. I don't get it to play the way I want to. Now, you might wonder if maybe they just need to improve the sound engine. And eventually, you'll be able to notate exactly the way you want to uh, to paper, uh, readable score, uh, and it will play back perfectly. No, I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't think that'll ever happen. I'll tell you why. Um, I don't think even with the best AI algorithms, they're ever going to re be able to get this to be absolute because uh, dynamics and articulation is, um, it's all relative, which I've, a point I've made before. Forte doesn't always mean the same thing piece to piece to piece, even among the same players. Um, and, and here's my proof. If I have five orchestras play the same Beethoven symphony, it will sound different be across all five orchestras. If I have five orchestras with the same conductor play Beethoven symphony, it's going to sound pretty different across all five orchestras. If I have one orchestra play Beethoven, uh, a Beethoven symphony five different times with five different conductors, it will sound different every time. And the reason why this will be is because of the change in personnel. You have an opinion, you have a directorship, a conductorship, a creative influence that demands a particular outcome. And that is always going to be different, right? 
and you and you also have some compromise at some level between that individual and the ensemble that they're working with. There's always a little give and take there. Um, any conductor can demand that they have what they want, but you only work with who you have, uh, even the very best. And, you, and we all know this. If you listen to orchestral music, you know that orca orchestras sound different. Chicago sounds different from New York and Baltimore and Pittsburgh. They don't all sound the same, right? They're, they're different qualities to them, and conductors across them are different. That's why the AI can never do it absolutely, ever. It just can't. Now, what what happens here is you become the conductor. You're the conductor. The only way for you to influence this program... Now, it, now think about the digital audio workstation atmosphere. If you're in a digital audio workstation and you're mocking up in there... There's no such thing as dynamics. You just have you just have zero through 127 different settings in MIDI, right? For velocity, for for volume, for modulation, for all the different kinds of controllers that you have. Uh, you have a variety of settings, zero to 127 or 128 total, that you can pick from. You don't really have dynamics. That translates into dynamic notation in MuseScore, and you can choose what you want. My fortissimo here means forte in notation, but for the callback of samples, it's going to have to be fortissimo for me to get the sound that I want. As the conductor, as the director of this ensemble, I demand that the horns play louder here than other people, which means I don't change the notation on the music that my orchestra is reading. I have to change the dynamic here to call on those samples, right? If I was a conductor in a real environment with a real orchestra, I would say, can you bring that out a little bit? I don't go over to their music and cross out the dynamic and put a new dynamic on it. I just say, play a little bit louder. I can't tell the computer to do that. I have to change it. So I change the notation to call something out. If I want a, a, a crescendo, let me find a spot here and see where this happens. If I want a crescendo to go out beyond, here's one, or a decrescendo. So I've got a, I've got a decrescendo here, diminuendo. I'm coming down, getting softer, but I don't want it to end at, uh, uh, I don't want to put a quarter note here to make it end at piano. I put the piano after the beat, which means it doesn't ever actually get to piano. I can do the same thing. I can do a crescendo, and I don't want it to hit the whole, f the absolute forte samples. But if I put the forte two beats later in a rest area, and I put the crescendo leading up to that, it will call up the samples up to the point where the note stops, but not any further, right? So I can I can really dial in what samples and, and crossfade I am drawing on as it's playing back, right? You got to think in this way. Articulations are another thing. I can put in specific articulations to get specific sounds that I might not actually put in the notation. There's a place over here where triplets, let me find it. Um, so I have the brass playing some triplet figures here, some chordal planing. Notice there's no articulation on this. I found that the samples that it kicked back were aggressive. Really aggressive, automatically. I didn't have to put anything on them. If you listen, let's listen to this here. So I'm not listening to much of this piece. Man, that's really aggressive, right? Really aggressive, particularly the trombone part. It's only forte. That was good enough. I didn't need to put a fortissimo on it. I'm not even sure that there's a layer beyond that right now in the Muse sounds. Um, but I put it on forte. I didn't have to put any other kind of accents or articulation. It's it's going it's going for everything right now, right? It's it's everything they've got. Uh, really brassy, really buzzy. That's those are the samples I got. So that's what I use. If I needed to get something more, I would have added articulations to get what I want. If I wanted to accent. A particular part of this uh, triplet, I could put some kind of articulation on it to make it play out, even though that might not be what's in the notation if this was to be read by an orchestra. Okay, so again, treat the notation like a digital audio workstation. You might as well do that because nobody's reading, nobody's going to play your orchestra music. 
Okay, most of you out there, again, the vast majority of orchestra music that you hear right now, there's a whole lot of orchestra music being written by a lot of people, hobbyists and professionals alike. The vast majority of what you're hearing is is all mock-up. Scholastic music is the, uh, I think, the objection to that rule. You know, scholastic music, which is typically of a more accessible and lower quality and composition value because it's for educational purposes, that kind of music is getting played regularly. So unless you're one of those composers, your music's not getting played a lot. And if you are one of those composers, you're mostly writing uh, just to eat. You're, you're writing to make a paycheck, um, and you're working with a publishing company to publish regular music. Again, usually scholastic music for high schools, uh, junior high some college stuff, right? Your music's not going to get played. It's not going to get played. So not not large scale stuff. Now the small stuff, okay? Small chamber works. Um, I get that. You might get that stuff played for sure. If you have access to some college students or some professionals, or if you have a group that you play in, uh, certainly some of that stuff is going to get played. Uh, and I totally get that. But we're really talking about these large orchestra mock-ups. If you're doing large orchestra mock-ups, again, most of the music you're put, you're hearing is done in a workstation. It's never put into notation because it's never played by an orchestra. Knowing that is very liberating because now you can just write your music for the sound rather than for the notation. Okay, so those are my big, uh, big issues here with getting realism. You have to do some unor unorthodox things uh, to get good sound. We'll talk a little bit about composition uh, and how I go about composing. First of all, I compose in concert pitch. So I just put it in concert pitch, so I'm in C score, and I'm reading everything in where, where uh, C means the same thing everywhere, right? A means the same thing everywhere. The only thing I'm contending with is, of course, different clefs as I'm dealing in different instruments. So I compose in C, um, most people, again, going back to that creative genius thing, most people do sketches. So composers that write pencil to paper, again, creative genius, uh, they're doing the same thing. They're just going to sketch. They're going to a C sketch. They're just notating on a grand staff or maybe two or three grand staff sets. Uh, and on there, they're writing uh, with text, you know, violins down here, trumpets take this, put it in parentheses, and then they pass that off, or they or they expand it out from their reduction to full orchestration later on. But they're writing in C. That is not a crutch. It's just efficient. It's just efficient. It's an efficient way to look. You're looking at the music. Right? We're not worrying about the technicalities of transposition. We're composing music. This is about music. It's not about um, uh, transposition intervals. <laughs> okay, That's not our concern right now as we're writing. Um, so I compose in C just right from there. Um, I sometimes will mock up first in reduction, on a, like a piano reduction. But usually what I do is I write the strings first. I'll usually write all my string material to start with, and then I'll go to the uh, other other areas. Unless I have something specific that I want, if I have a brass idea or a woodwind idea, I'll write that directly to brass or woodwind. This is very much composition, no matter if you're doing it in uh, you know, in a notation program, Finale, Sibelius, Dorico, uh, Musecore, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if you're doing it there or if you're doing it to pencil, uh, to paper, it's very much like writing a paper with text, right? It's like writing a report of some kind. Usually you'll do your research, you'll put things onto note cards, you'll organize your note cards, you'll take the concepts with attribution labeled for those note cards, and then you will organize them, and then you will transcribe those ideas with uh, uh, um, transitioning concepts into the final paper, right? Same idea. That's what we're doing here. We're taking melodic, motivic, harmonic ideas, sketching them out, dropping things in here, dropping something in over there, piecing it together, maybe working across multiple files. This is how composition is done. And it is the same if it is done on notation program, so a notation software program, or if it's done pencil to paper. It is the same thing. It doesn't matter who you are. It's all the same. Um, another thing that I do is I don't usually write in order. Let's go here to the middle, and I'll show you what I wrote first. I compose this up to uh, this hit right here. So I'll play for you the spot that I composed first. That's
That's what I wrote first, that section. Okay. Um, and it started really just playing around with the brass chordal planing and this woodwind stuff up here uh, and the strings playing sustained trills uh, with a ostinato going on down here. Right? Very filmic, very film-like. Um, and, and then it ended up in this hit over here. I was also experimenting around. Now we'll get to some of these sounds. If you look here, I have a trumpet EXT, trumpet extended, and you'll see I'm into the red. Now the one problem with the samples in the Muse sounds is that they don't really extend up to where professionals can play. This is within, as a trumpet player, this is in my range. I can play this, right? If I popped up my trumpet, I can scream these notes out. Solid, rock solid, nail it every time. Uh, it's not unheard of for, uh, players with some some experience to be able to do this uh, particularly if you're playing on a C instrument or if you're playing in, as you would in an orchestra you might be playing on a keyed instrument like a, a D or an E flat trumpet uh, or a piccolo you might have access here now this is very commercial sounding B flat playing but uh, you can see that if we were out of transposition we're up we're up in the uh, up there right we're up in E playing a high E uh, and, uh, that's, that's within the, it's high, but it's within the realm of a professional. Muse scores, Muse sound says, nope, 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 we don't have that note. That's not capable. We're not, we're not there. Uh, so what I did is I put the MS classic sound in here, the, the, the fluid GM sound trumpet, which sounds horrible on its own, but just for a couple of notes. And then in the mixer setting, what I do is I drop it back. I pull it back a little bit. So number one, make sure that you have it panned identically to the same place as the other samples. And then I just pull it down a little bit. And also I give it a lower dynamic. Oh, just move something I shouldn't have. Uh, I give it a lower dynamic. You can see that I'm playing uh, forte, whereas I'm pushing fortissimo samples on the other. Okay, so I pull the dynamic down a little bit. I also notate in, like I would in a DAW, I would use the uh, modulation wheel or the pitch bend, and I put in a glissando, and I have this glissando, uh, glissando playing back the portamento playback, which works with the GM sound fonts. Uh, so I've put that in there so you get a little bit of a, a scoop, as you would in a high register playing very commercial sound, that kind of dwee, right, at the very beginning of the note. And uh, it sounds like this. Here's the so I have one note here. I got to hit that high uh, concert C sharp, and then going up to the high concert D. Uh, here's what we get. <laughs> And you can hear that, it, that little dig in there, that little commercial sound right on the beat, and it just blends right in with everything else going on. So um, extend the capability beyond what Muse Sounds can do by using the basic sounds a little bit. Sneak in some basic sounds every now and then to extend some capability uh, whenever you need to, and use the notation to sequence uh, program as you would in a digital audio workstation. There would be some programming involved there uh, using uh, uh, controllers. Uh, use your notation as controllers, right, to program in different nuanced uh, articulations and whatnot. So um, that's the first thing I wrote. Now, one thing that came out of this was this little motive right up here. If I just highlight it and the horn, horn's playing it and it's also playing in a couple of other instruments. If I play this back, I took that idea and then I spun it out into a melody. So the second thing that I wrote uh, is not this here actually, but the melody. I went back to the strings way back at the beginning. And I composed this down here. So I'm just going to select the strings. And uh, the first original sketch was not as elaborate. Let's listen. So here's that melody at the beginning. You can see ba -dee -da -dee -da. It's not exactly the same pitch collection, but it's the same contour. I love mushy stuff. Especially when you I love to I love to mix mushy sentimental stuff with fanfare 
fast things, right? Again, I love film music. And like every other composer in the world, I've been highly influenced by film music and great orchestral film composers like John Williams and Silvestri and Ennio Morricone and you know some of these guys that, that wrote uh, this type of juxtaposition of a very sweet sentimental lyrical melodies juxtaposed with fanfare and ostinato driven kinds of textures so um i love that love that stuff so anyway that's what i was after here i took that initial motive that i created somewhere else and then i spun it out into a melody and used a chord progression that just conveyed that kind of sentimentality that i was after um another thing i did here is again i'm not worried about the notation if i was if i was writing this for for people to play i would put a dynamic here probably mezzo forte and that would be it that would be it. I wouldn't write crescendo de crescendo, crescendo de crescendo, mezzo forte, mezzo piano. Mezzo. I would not do that. It would just be one dynamic with my phrase markings, and that would be the end of it. But I'm trying to dictate what mu sounds I want to play. I'm making a realistic mock-up. Nobody's going to ever play this piece of music. Um, for my master's study, I wrote a symphonic piece. It was 40 minutes long. It was a nine-movement work uh, uh, called The Flying Mountains. It was based on roller coasters. So each movement was based on an iconic roller coaster that you can find uh, in the United States. And uh, I composed this thing for symphony orchestra, and nobody's ever played it. Nobody's ever going to play it. I've had stuff played, but no one's ever going to play that. It just isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. I've mocked it up, right, using the technology I have available to me, and I've released it as a mock-up. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what it's going to be, right? And fortunately, we live in a time when we can do that. There was a time when you couldn't do that kind of thing, or the mock-ups, you had to do an awful lot of programming to get a realistic mock-up using uh, you know, very limited samples. I think the very best at that back in the day before you had East-West, you know, uh, Quantum Leap, um, way before Spitfire, you know, way before some of these other companies came out, you're dealing with sound fonts, um, uh, would be James Newton Howard. James Newton Howard uh, was known in the 90s for doing these incredible mock-ups using very basic uh, synthy samples. And I'm talking about like using the GM, fluid GM uh, MuseScore sound. You can use just that sound, and if you program it enough in a digital audio workstation with enough layers and using unorthodox samples from the collection to do various things, you can make a really realistic mock-up. You can do it, but you're going to have to put an awful lot of time and programming into it with an awful lot of tracks. It's going to take a lot of time. So what MuseScore 4 has done is it's eliminated a lot of programming by adding this kind of AI component to uh, the, the choices, to choosing uh, samples, um, you know, based on notation, using notation to play back those samples. So we have that benefit going for us, but there's still programming to be done. And you can see it here. I've done a lot of programming. I'm programming the sentimental sweet stuff. I want these swells that a section would intuitively do just by seeing mezzo forte here. I want them to play it specifically the way I want them to do it. I'm the conductor. I'm the director. This is my group. So I have to tell it what to do. Again, I wouldn't put this in notation. I'm just doing this because I'm trying to get a mock-up. This is a playback file. And no one's ever going to play this piece of music. right? For me to create this as a notation file to share on the .com site is just pure hubris. I would do that just for the sake of creating a piece of art, which is this notation. It's just a piece of art, an artwork, a representation of music in notation form for people to appreciate as a piece of artwork because nobody's going to play it it's too big i don't have the money for it let's go back to uh the east west quantum leap 25 years ago right company comes out uh and they 
they record these samples and they put out this edition of sampled sounds. And you're talking like $1,000 to buy everything back at that time. And soon after that, it was several thousand dollars to buy a large sample set. And I remember the mock-ups that they were coming up with at that time were amazing. And they still hold up. They're still amazing using those old samples. Now, some people will use those samples now in a digital audio workstation and say, oh, these sound terrible. That's because they're not programming it enough. But those folks back then when they created those mock-ups, they took the time to really program every little nuance so that you were key switching between samples multiple layers you're going you're, you're, you're stacking up articulations and different different groups and solos right on top of sections to make it sound as real as possible and they were making these mock-ups that still today when you listen to those mock-ups they sound real i mean they just sound absolutely real and they're 25 years old on some of the earliest uh, 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 VST sample sets from that company. Um, they're still good. They're still good. Now, what the argument was back then that we would make is you'd say, hey, you pay a couple thousand dollars for these libraries. And in the first composition you make, the library pays for itself because how much would it cost to get an orchestra together? Right, to get a scoring session with people good enough to sight read it in a short period of time, the only amount of time that you have to pay for would be several thousand dollars. So that was the argument is, hey, this is totally worth it to buy this and then use a workstation and put the time and effort into programming because this library pays for itself after the first piece of music that you make. Fast forward to today, we have Muse Score 4 and Muse Sounds. What did you pay for this? I'm sorry, what did you pay for this? Right? It's free. Outrageous. Outrageous that this is free. Totally free. Now, I, I, now this is not for the MuseScore people to go get, get thinking about this and thinking they should charge for it. Please don't do that because this is amazing. But you have something that has a lot of intuition to it. It's been a kind of programmed on the back end to make really good choices. But to really make it realistic you're going to have to make more choices and the only way you're going to do it is with notation this is a digital audio workstation it's just instead of using midi in tracks you're using staves right you're using the staff using notation and articulation um look at what i'm getting away with here i don't have four horns i think i split to three at most in this piece um, I don't write to four different parts, which is a little unorthodox. Normally in an orchestra, orchestra, you would split down to four. I just didn't find the need for it. Uh, but I split to three, three, and three in the brass section, one for the tuba. Uh, and I put it all in single lines. I might as well because the Muse Sounds um, play engine plays multiple notes really well. There, it seems to be drawing on round round robin samples. Right. I don't know what's going on in the back end. All I know is that this, just the brass section here, okay, again, only one staff per part. All I know is that that sounds mighty good. It sounds like section brass, right? Even though it's going from solo to three-way divide. I, I can't explain it. You know, it really shouldn't sound as good as it does, but it does. So if I was doing this in a MIDI mock-up, I would probably have three separate horn tracks with a solo on each one. Here, it just seems to work, probably because the samples are so good and because the AI choices that are being made for... Uh, the legato crossfades are just so on point, I can get away with it. Uh, if I find a moment where I can't get away with it, sure, I would split it out and put a solo horn on each one. And I'd probably offset them and use slightly different dynamics and articulation to ensure that it's drawing from different sample sets across the different parts. But I don't need to. It seems to work. It seems to work here well enough. Now, on top of that, there are section... Uh, samples. So if I go to the Muse Sounds in the brass, you have a trumpets and trumpet. I found that the trumpet singular seems to work best on the divide. 
Um, one of the reasons is because if I would put trumpets and it would be like three trumpets, when I go to this octave split, I'd have six trumpets playing all of a sudden, like I have going on in the strings down here. But for some reason, it's not as noticeable in the strings as it is up here. So anyway, yeah, very unorthodox things going on, but I'm after, I'm after the sound. I'm writing music. I'm not writing notation. I'm writing music. Uh, another thing is that I've done a few commercial kinds of things. I've added a, a synthesizer for sub bass. That's a recording technique. I use an MS uh, Warm Synth is the sound I'm using, and I have it set really low, so it very barely can be heard. If I uh, select the uh, contrabasses and the um, uh, synthesizer here, uh, in fact, I'll do I'll do the celli uh, because they're doubled most of the time. Uh, and the synthesizer, you can hear it. In fact, I'll do it without. I'll do it without the synthesizer first. Listen to this. Uh, actually, here's where I want to go. Okay, so you can see the dynamic contrast there to make it play the way I want, put the swell where I want it. Now I'm going to add uh, the warm synthesizer. You can barely hear it. If you really, if you know it's there, you'll notice a little bit of rumble in the bass. And the way you do this is you can use like a sine wave or something. I like to use this because it's got a little bit of grit in it because um, it's a little bit more bang for the buck. But what you do is you play it and you take this all the way down and bring it up until you can just barely hear it and then push it back a little bit. So I bring it up until I can just hear, sense that it's there, and then I just draw it down just a couple clicks, and then I leave it there, and that's it. And whenever I have special effects going, I've got pizzicato at one point later on, I just cut the synthesizer out. I don't want it to play that. Uh, I want to make sure that I can hear the pits, and I don't have that synth playing through that section. So I just cut it out, and then when we go back to Arco, I bring I bring the synthesizer back in. So that's one thing I've done. So to make it sound a little bit more commercial, um, I'm trying to think other uh, techniques here I have going on. Uh, you can see how often I'm using just a single sound. So I should have two flutes playing here in a section, but I just have one flute line, and I have it playing essentially solo. It's not I'm not doubling samples. It just seems to work okay. And then when it splits to two, uh, which I don't do very much, but when it does, see the oboes, I have two oboes, two clarinets. When it splits, it's just that the sample library is so good, uh, and the AI driving it, and the engine is so good, it just sounds really clean, and you, it's not really a noticeable expansion of the section uh, by doing that. So uh, now that you've heard me rant on and on, so that's a little bit of my composition prog uh, process. I tend to focus on strings first. I often write from the middle and work my way out. Uh, and then whenever I have repetition, you want to make sure you change the repetition a little bit, but make sure you're using repetition. Um, I use unorthodox notation because I'm going for the mock-up. Uh, I use some of the MS sounds to expand uh, the ranges a little bit where I need to. Here I've got a trill written in, and I actually wrote it in. I, hap I put in 16th notes, and I haphazardly placed some um, uh, dots to make it a little uneven. But again, listen, just listen to this lick. You can hear that horn rip on the end and you can hear that, that trill in there. I notated the trill rather than putting a trill on it. And the reason why I did is because I'm sharing a staff. So you have the, if in fact, if I just uh, uh, solo this one track here, listen. It's amazing. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. But I had, had to put some effort into the notation here. Rather than separate this out and put a, a trill line on it, I just notated out the trill, and it still manages to play uh, the whole notes underneath. It's just they've got a really kicking play engine going on there that doesn't get interrupted. I don't have to. I can use a separate layer here. I don't have to notate. <laughs> 
you know, ties to make this work. I can just put in two layers and the engine plays it back really well. And in spite of the fact, again, that I'm going from a solo instrument to a divide, it just seems to work really, really well. Now, there's probably a limitation to doing this again, and you might want to have multiple staves in there. But again, I'm just going for the sound. No one's going to read this. So I've put it all in one staff and it seems to work out. Now I can use this template and keep everything condensed down. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it works out, works out. So experiment in that way. One last thing um, about the sound output. Uh, it is true. I don't use any, I haven't been using any extra sounds uh, and any extra work on these. Uh, the one thing I do, though, is I do master. So when I get to the end of the process, I do master the output. So I export as wave, and then I take it into uh, an audio editor, usually Audacity. I usually compress it just use the, the um, default setting, right? I run it through the compressor one time and I'll normalize it just to make sure that I'm using all the width of the uh, um, waveform uh, in the track and there's no spikes that are going out beyond. I, I want to try to eliminate anything that's excessive and try to compress it down so that it's a little bit more workable. Then I'll normalize it to like negative one or two db and then i'll take that into a a quick online mastering suite band lab has one i'll throw it up there and just do the generic mastering bring it back out and then what i'll do sometimes i didn't do it on this one i'll envelope it so i'll put it back in audacity and i might put a couple of volume envelopes just so quiet parts are quiet enough and loud parts are the loudest you know sometimes you'll get the output like this should be pretty loud at the end but i i pull this little gag a couple times in there i want the last one to be the loudest so i might put a little bit of a volume envelope just so that this one's a little bit louder than the others right that kind of thing i did not do that on this i i think on this one i just put it out i normalized it compressed it ran it through the mastering uh online ai powered generic mastering uh, and then I normalized it after that. So that's it. So that doesn't really change the quality of the samples. All it does is it gets the EQ and the loudness a little bit more commercial grade. Um, sometimes I'll do my own mastering rather than send it out doing the generic thing. It's just the generic thing is a, it's just quicker and it's good enough. Um, my thoughts on mastering real quick. I think it's better to have your mix, which you don't have to worry too much about it in here. Like the, they have a lot of this worked out. The samples are great. They balance great. They're they're rel they're relatively consistent to the room. The reverb is excellent, even though we don't have a lot of control over it right now in the stable release at this point in time. That's all great. I mean, it's all great. It, you, you almost don't even need to master it. It just sounds really, really great. You might need to compress it a little bit to get the loudness right where you'd want it. But otherwise, the balance is fantastic. The equalization is excellent. You don't really need to change anything. However, I find that if I'm working in a digital audio workstation, I've already EQ'd each track uh, and filtered each track, set my reverb to each section, I've done all that in the mix so that when I get to the end, I don't really have to master it, right? At the end, the only thing I want to deal with in mastering is, is, is compression. Maybe one blanket EQ to just resolve a couple of basic, very small changes, usually to break, make it a little brighter and get rid of a little bit of the mud, the tiny bit, the tiniest bit, hardly even perceptible, right? That's what I'm doing in mastering. So I highly recommend that your philosophy on mastering should be like that. Your mastering should be as little as possible. Your mix should already have everything done. Unfortunately, for the Muse sounds, it already sounds amazing. I mean, that was purely out. That was not mastered in any way. It sounds really, really good. A lot of detail in there, 
really great work on this this uh, sample set and engine. So anyway, that's how you get things real. Some people are not going to like this. Some people turned me off a long time ago. Some people are going to say, well, it just isn't there yet. I'll wait longer. Look, you're going to be waiting forever because, like I said, five different orchestras, five different conductors, you know, whatever. It's all going to – everyone's going to sound different. For you to get what you want, you're going to have to do more programming. The, the, the computer – Software isn't going to do it for you. It ain't going to happen. You're going to have to alter something about it to make it the way you want. You'll have to use unorthodox notation. You'll have to use articulations where you otherwise might not use them. You'll have to use dynamics in an uneven way. You're going to have to add a lot more. right? You're going to have to do things differently to make it, the, make it work the way you want. Anyway, I think I've exhausted everything there about my process and how to get realism. Um, hopefully this resonates with some of you. And remember, point number one, ain't nobody playing your symphonic music. <laughs> if you're writing it into notation as notation, keep in mind that notation work you're doing, unless you have something lined up, which good for you if you do. I mean, there are opportunities. I had a, I've had a couple in life. Right, but for most of for most of you and for most of us out there, uh, ain't nobody playing your orchestral music. So don't worry about the notation. Go for the mock-up. Go for the mock-up. Notate in Muse Score to make the engine and the sample set play as realistic as you can. Take that starting place philosophy, and you'll be much happier uh, with your output. So anyway, best of luck with that. Happy mixing.